The female population is always greater than the male, but since the woman needs to be protected by a man, the king would maintain many girls who acted either as friends or as maid servants of the queen. In the history of Krishna's household, why we find that Krishna married 16,108 wives. Uh, these were not maid servants, but direct queens, and Krishna expanded himself into 16,108 forms to maintain different establishments for each and every wife. This is not possible for ordinary men. Therefore, although the kings had to maintain many, many servants and wives, not all of them had different establishments. When Sukhacharya gave Devayani in marriage to Yayati, he had some mischief to go with her, but he warned the king. I the king, never allow this girl some mischief to lie with you in your bed. O oh, King Parish, upon seeing Devayani with a nice son, so Mishra once approached King Ayati at the appropriate time for conception, and as in glory play, she requested the king, the husband of her friend, Vivian, who would be her to have a son also. When Princess Sarmishka begged King Ayati for a son, the king was certainly aware of the principles of religion, and therefore he agreed to fulfill her desire. Although we remember the warning of Supercharya, he thought of this union as desire of Supreme and thus he had sex with Sarmishka. Therefore, King Ayati was completely aware that he did Kshatriya, when a Kshatriya is approached by a woman, he cannot deny her. This is a religious principle. Consequently, when Dharmaraj Yudhisthira saw Arjuna unhappy after Arjuna returned from the war, he asked whether Arjuna had refused a woman who had begged for a son. Although Maharaj Yati remembered Supercharya's warning, he could not refuse Sarmishta. He thought it wise to give her a son unless he had sexual intercourse with her after a menstrual period. This kind of lust is not against religious principles, as stated in Bhagavad Gita. Dharma de Buddha Bhutte Shukamu Sme. Sex life not contrary to the principles of religion is sanctified by Krishna. He got Sarmishra, the daughter of the king, at Devayati, for a son, a combination of lust. It was not lust, but an act of religion. Devayati gave birth to Kuyadu and Kurvasu, and Sarmishka gave birth to Dru, Hyu, Anu, and Kuru. When the crowd of Devyan understood from outside sources that Sarmishka was pregnant by her husband, she was frenzied with anger, lest she departed from her father's house. For her father's house. Yeah. King Ayanti, who was very lusty, followed his wife, caught her and tried to appease her by speaking pleasing words and massaging her feet, but he could not satisfy her by human beings. Supercharged was extremely angry. You untruthful fool, lusting after women. You have done a great wrong, he said. I therefore curse you to be attacked and disfigured by old age and invalidity. King Yati said, O oh, learned and worshipable Brahma, I have not yet satisfied my lust and desires with your daughter. So Kacharya then replied, You may exchange your old age with someone who will agree to transfer his youth to you. For her part, when King Ayati said he had not yet satisfied his lust and desire with Supercharya's daughter, Supercharya saw that it was against the interests of his own daughter, for he had to continue in old age and in validity, or certainly his lusty daughter uh, would not be satisfied. Therefore, Supercharya blessed his son-in-law by saying that he would he could exchange his old age for someone else's youth. He indicated that the Yati's son would exchange the youth for the Yati's old age, and Yati would continue to enjoy his sex. When Yayati perceived this benediction from Supercharya, he requested his elder son, My dear son Yadu, please give me your youth in exchange for my old age and invalidity. My dear son, I am not yet satisfied in my sexual desires of your kind, and you can take the old age given by your material grandfather, maternal grandfather, and I may have your youth so that I may enjoy life for a few years more. Purport, this is the nature of lust and desires, and what we has said comes as Dr. Gagana. When one is too attached to sense gratification, he actually loses his sense. The word for Gagana refers to one who has lost his sense. Here's an example. The father shamelessly asked his son to exchange youth for old age. Of course, the entire world is under such illusion. Therefore, it is said that everyone is Pramatta or exclusively man. Unam Pramatta to a case of karma, and one becomes almost like a madman and indulges in sex and sense gratification. Sex and sense gratification can be controlled, however, and one achieves perfection when he has no desires for sex. This is possible only when one is fully Krishna conscious. Yadavadi, Mamachita Krishna Kadara Vinde, Navadava Rasa Daman, uh 
Ditam Ranto Asi Tadabuti Bata Nari Sangam Ne Smaryamane Babati Mukha Vikara Sushtu Nistivanam Sa. Since I had been engaged in the transcendental loving service of Krishna, realizing every new pleasure in him, whenever I think of sex pleasure, I spit it upon my lips, curl with disgust. Sexual desire can be stopped only when one is fully Krishna conscious and not otherwise. As long as one desires for sex, one can must change his body and transmigrate trans from one body to another to enjoy sex in different species of life. And although this form, the forms may differ, the business of sex is the same. Therefore, it is said, Puna Punas Charvita Charvana Nam. Those who are very much attached to sex migrate from one body to another with the same business of chewing the chew, tasting sex enjoyment as a dog, sex enjoyment as a hog, sex enjoyment as a mini god, and so on. So here we have a very nice condemnation of sex life. <laughs> and in spite of the fact that all these were supposed to be exalted personalities and one was dynasty, we find that the Yati, uh, he more or less lost his sense. Or the Bhagavad Gita says, uh, by meditating on sense objects, uh, then one gets angry and one uh, loses one's memory. Uh, one loses one's intelligence and discretion of what is right and wrong, and eventually one commits a sinful act and falls down into lower species of life. So though these were exalted personalities, we see that it is the same scenario affected them. And the Yaki is supposed to be the king and uh, supposed to be uh, uh, knowledgeable of the rules of Dharma, etc. We see that he will distort these rules for his own purposes. So when uh, Sarmishti comes and asks him for a child, then he agrees because he's, uh, his desire is there. And in spite of the fact that he made a promise to Supercharya, who is his guru. <laughs> so, and uh, he made the promise to his guru so he could avoid a curse you know, uh, from Supercharya. He agreed to everything and then he breaks that promise because of uh, his well as a shakir duty who must. Uh, Fulfill the request of this woman who is my wife also, so or the main servant or whatever. And so he can use some excuse to uh, satisfy his desires. So therefore the rules are there in the scripture, but even these exalted personalities are difficult to follow these rules. Let's speak of ordinary people. <laughs> so although the rules are there, it's a little bit difficult to always follow them. And therefore there's always uh, uh, possibility of breaking the rules in spite of the fact that people do have knowledge. And in Bhagavad Gita, of course, um, Krishna explains that when Arjuna says, in spite of uh, not wanting to, one is overcome by karma and then grows up and uh, commits sinful acts, etc. We know the principle, but we commit these sinful acts. And what is the reason, of course, is because of this. The, the desire is too strong and it, it, it makes one forget one's intelligence uh, derived from scripture. So we forget the rules and then we are distorted from whatever for our own purposes. So this is the uh, problem that we find in uh, the process of uh, dharma we have rules, but then um, in one sense good to set the standard, but then when uh, the gunas change and karma and proto become prominent, then we get problems in here. So it's not a foolproof system, but to some degree, it gives some control. And it sets some standard for everybody, even if they cannot follow perfectly. So that, of course, is the whole goal, to set standards for people. And the, we can say the unique quality of our national system it recognizes people are differently qualified, so there's different standards for different sets of people. Shankar is one standard, Brahms are another standard, Vaish is another standard, Sudha is another standard, because they have different amounts of sense control. Uh, so that's a little bit remarkable there. Uh, in any case, uh, the standards are there, and people try to fulfill those standards as much as possible. And if they don't, that is called sin. The result of sin is bad karma, suffering in the future. 
So they get this is the you could say their the warning for them that because of they, they do this sinful activity they will get bad karma in the future. Uh, so um, that's some sort of uh, preventative measure for them that they get some bad results even though they want to enjoy now. But even in spite of that, people still uh, commit the sinful activity uh, because of this uh, loss of intelligence and uh, we could say their madness or whatever. So, not a foolproof system, though uh, the attempt is there to uh, keep standards. So, uh, gradually, so right after life, from following this system, uh, uh, one can get more and more sense in but it's a very gradual process. Uh, so this is, we can say, the problem here with the, that system is that it's so gradual that uh, uh, it takes a long, long time to just get to this end, the, the position of sense control. Let's be a spiritual life. <laughs> So it's a big endeavor, but uh, this is, you can say, a common system for everybody to follow. And when they get to the, 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 the sattva position, uh, then they're expected to have more interest in spiritual life, as from the Brahmins or whatever. Uh, so that has its plus point and negative point. Okay? Um, so, Prabhupada here mentions the, the process of Krishna consciousness and how uh, the, the process is a little different uh, uh, in, the, in the, the system of uh, Varnashram and the rules and regulations of the Smritis. Uh, uh, the rules are there to set a standard and then the, the uh, impetus to follow is Punya and Papa. Uh, if you follow nicely, you get more enjoyment, and if you don't follow, you get suffering. <laughs> That's the basic impetus. Huh? But, of course, this is all material. Material enjoyment and material suffering. Huh? In the process of bhakti, huh? uh, the, the impetus is quite different. <laughs> it's completely different. Huh? It's nothing to do with material pleasure and, uh, and uh, getting material pleasure and avoiding material pain. In fact, it's, it's not getting enjoyment at all. It's giving enjoyment to the Supreme Lord, which is completely different. <laughs> it's a completely different concept. But it is a very effective process to produce these results of controlling the senses, avoiding sinful activity, etc. But these are all secondary results of the process. Now, of course, in the progress of bhakti, there may be the same problems as one finds in the Varnashram system where we have the yati affected uh, by uh, sinful desires, etc., or lust, or whatever. Uh, so in, in the uh, bhakti yoga also, people will have the same problems. Why? Because they're starting at the bottom of <laughs> Or any position, whatever they are, you know, whatever position of the gunas they are, they're starting and they're progressing. So we see here even the Ayati who is supposed to be a Raja Sattva has problems. Uh, and we see that the Sukracharya and his uh, daughter uh, and Sattva have problems also. Uh, so uh, in any good, there are going to be some problems somewhere uh, in, in within the goodness. So in Bhakti Yoga, as one goes through the process, yes, there will be problems because uh, one is going through the gunas also and getting out of the gunas. Uh, but the, the difference is that uh, the process itself is beyond the gunas. It's not in the gunas. The Varnashram system is working in the gunas, with the gunas. Everything is in the gunas. Uh, and bhakti is beyond the gunas. Uh, that's, that's one big difference. As I said, the goal is completely different. The motivation is different. Uh, so until one gets this new motivation, you cannot practice bhakti properly. So that is why it's other systems to give people. Uh, why not? Okay, you want to have your material life fine. So you, you have your pleasurable material life, and you avoid the sin. And to get that, then you follow these rules. So that's the motivation there. It's a material motivation. But that is the common motivation of most people in the material world. 
So that's, that's why the one optional system is recommended for everybody. To come to the position of not having material desire and having another goal of pleasing the Lord, that's quite unique, quite rare. So therefore, that's why it's not said everybody has to be bhakti. <laughs> uh, so it requires some sort of elevation of sorts. Uh, so fortunately, um, that qualification, which we call Shraddha, is available for everybody, regardless of the guna, which is remarkable also. How can faith arise in a Tamilan person, a Rajatan person, whatever? Yeah. So that connection with Bhakti can arise even if one is in the gunas. And uh, whether it arises in a Tamilan person or a Sakhalan person, it makes no difference. We cannot differentiate that this person is better than that person. And he gets us one from Tamilan, this one from Sakhalan. We don't make that differentiation. And therefore, we have the example in Lord Chaitanya's life. Uh, he was worshipping Kharidas Thakura, who was supposed to be in a, a Macha, in a Tamilan, very Tamilan origin. So, yet he puts him on the highest level because of his devotion. So, uh, therefore, the uh, process of bhakti is a little bit different from this other system. Uh, but, as like I said, a little bit uncommon because one has to have this completely different goal in mind. But if it arises in anyone, then they, they practice bhakti and they surpass the system completely. Right? But as I said, of course, in the process, they will also have problems like this due to the influence of the gunas. <laughs> This does not mean that bhakti is in the gunas, it means that the person is in the gunas. <laughs> so in the uh, third canto of Bhagavatam, Kapila does, uh, Muni describes uh, bhakti in the mode of ignorance, bhakti in the mode of passion, bhakti in the mode of goodness. Or like I said, well, how, I thought bhakti was there, but I thought you were bhakti in the mode of uh, ignorance or whatever, like that. How's it possible? Uh, so then uh, Vishnu Thakurai says, actually, it's not that bhakti is in the mode of ignorance. It's the person is in the mode of ignorance, and that motivates his bhakti. That's all. So therefore, these types of bhakti in the modes are not actually so good. We can say it's a mixed devotion uh, with mixed desires. So a person who has massive goals, and he does bhakti, he worships the Lord, but he's in the mode of ignorance with ignorant goals of harming other people. They call it tunnel and bhakti, definitely not good. <laughs> and a person of the world of passion that has material goals in mind, and he worships the Lord. So obviously that's uh, because of like karma, Mr. Bhakti or something. And a person is sattva good, that has he can mix liberation in there, desire to liberation. So all of these not very good actually, it's not pure bhakti. But still. The bhakti itself is not impure. It's the people practicing it and imposing their different goals on it that makes a difference, that's all. Okay. So in spite of that, even with that mixture, the bhakti still operates to some degree and has some effect of raising their consciousness gradually. Okay. So they can raise the gunas by doing this type of bhakti even though it's not very good. Mm -hmm. But uh, the real uh, Possible positions to come to the level of pure bhakti, which is emphasized by Chaitanya um, Mahaprabhu and the Guru Goswami. So that position is the, the, the real uh, bhakti, and that gives much more remarkable results than any other uh, process, including the other types of bhakti. So even that process, however, is qualified in the sense that uh, we do pure bhakti. Or Krishna in sadhana when we're not pure. <laughs> so this looks like a little bit of a contradiction. How can it be pure if we're not pure? As in a person in Tamilu is being bhakti and we call Tamilu and bhakti. Yeah? So we call Tamilu and bhakti not because he's in Tamilu so much, but because of his Tamilu goals in there. If the Tamilu person rejects those goals in his pure bhakti, then he's in pure bhakti. If he doesn't have those goals and he only wants to please the Lord and nothing else, and he's in common good, then it's a pure bhakti, he is in common good. So, therefore, it's not the, the gunas itself, it's that goal that we have, and if it's pure, then we say it's pure bhakti, in spite of 
what the good ones are affected by. But, as I said, uh, since we are still in the Buddhist book of the Bhakti, then we still may have problems. The person may periodically be affected by these different uh, uh, gunas uh, according to the circumstances. As we see here, Yaya is affected in the, the, this process. So, in Bhakti also, one may be affected by the gunas because uh, uh, we're not completely free of the gunas yet, even though we're in pure Bhakti. So we call it pure bhakti because our goal is that pure level. And in execution of the bhakti, we do not pray for material things, we do not pray for liberation or for coming things or whatever like that. In that sense, it is pure. So that is the difference. Not that we are pure completely, because we're still the one as we have on our test, etc. So, the anarchist gradually disappeared. So we have the process of anarchism and that goes on from Bhajana Kriya all the way into Baba's days. Anarchists are gradually dissipated. That, that, so because of those anarchists, then the person can have problems. Though he's practicing for your But, I thought for says, less, 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 and less. So even in Baba, there can be problems. So therefore, the, uh, the process is there, uh, and uh, the difference from uh, the karma yoga process in Varnashram is that the goal is completely different. Uh, and though the person may be affected as in karma yoga, uh, still, uh, it is not in any way uh, harm the person's development, because Krishna says, apichets to the Rajra, even if he's, that's the most sinful activity due to the influence of the goddess on our it's still, it's still my devotee. That's not, not affect his position. In karma yoga, it does, and, and, and a Brahma can fall from his position, become a Brahma Bandhu or whatever, like this, that uh, uh, he, he can be, uh, like, uh, or, uh, um, not just a Brahma Bandhu, he can be a, a uh, fallen Kshatri or a fallen Vaishya uh, uh, because of sinful activities or whatever. So, uh, uh, Krishna does not say that they think about the body. That's a, that's a different process. Uh, so, anyway, the process of uh, purification takes place and, on, and in, in that process, in that duration, then, because of the anarchists, there may be mistakes made by the devotee. But Krishna does not regard that as a serious impediment. That's why he makes that statement of the Bhagavad Gita. Nine. That still is my goal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, why Krishna makes that statement in still my devotee is that uh, Krishna is more interested in the devotion than in the appearance of an artist. <laughs> in other words, he sees the positive aspect of that person that he is dedicating himself to the Supreme Lord. And yes, the anarchists are there, but not much interested in that. And of course, we can come around, that's a different case. Yeah. Then, then this indication is not so serious about what the after all. <laughs> it's got this opposite tendency that it's overtaking you. So, if there's no aparad, then in spite of the sinful activity, uh, the Lord more or less overlooks that. He doesn't care about that much, that the anarchists, because he knows that uh, the, the person is has that attraction and it's going to increase and increase and increase. And he's expecting it to reach the level of prima. So the Lord is eager for that. And therefore he's not interested in all these other anarchists that may appear along the way. So he accepts that person as a devotee and he keeps encouraging him on that path. Uh, so this is the very uh, sort of remarkable aspect of bhakti that um, the Lord uh, gives mercy so that the devotee can advance nicely. That mercy is not given in karma yoga or in gamma yoga or stamina yoga. The Lord does not personally involve himself with those devotees, but the, the practitioners. 
And therefore, in the 11th canto, you can say, I'm going to really care for Kaima and Yana and Yoga and Sankhya and all the other processes as I care for Bhakti. Okay. So as we know, in Prima, the Lord is under the control of the devotee. So uh, it's a very, very different process from the others. So uh, whatever problems are there in the process of devotion are minor in, in the uh, Karma organa, those problems become a major problem for the person, and they become very big of that within bhakti. These are minor things. Uh, and uh, why? Because of Krishna and his interest in the devotee. So uh, that is the, the main uh, process, therefore, for uh, purifying and saving the individual in the process of bhakti. The Lord is very merciful and in this case the devotee will be committed to this state. But sometimes we find that the devotee is also committed to this state. We see that he is being asked to go, uh, that makes the devotee more uh, weaker. He gives, he gives up the uh, devotee not to be loved. Why can't those devotees be encouraged? And the Lord says an example in the day to day life. Why do you find the same? Well, it depends on the circumstance. Uh, if the person repeatedly refuses to correct himself, then it becomes a problem. And he influences other people, that becomes a problem. If it's a minor mistake and he corrects himself and generally he is uh, uh, doing good devotional service and he is inspiration for others, it's not really a problem. But if there is uh, this idea that he's actually not so interested in Bhakti, then he can influence others. So it's a matter of judging just his spiritual standards, that's all. Uh, of course, we can take the risk and keep sheltering him, but then the problem with that is this may take advantage as well and <laughs> continue his bad activities or whatever, unknowingly or knowingly or whatever. Um, we don't know about him, we don't know about him. So uh, there's a risk there. And, uh, and of course, at a certain stage, we may not want to take that risk anymore. That's all. Uh, Maharaj, this question is not directly related to today's topic. Uh, so we have, we learned that Nitya Siddhas, uh, they are eternally liberated and hence they enjoy the, in the delegate part of the pastime of the Lord in Goloka, Dharam Vaikunta. So does it mean that Nitya, I mean, uh, all Jeevas who are inside the Karana Shari Shudha Vishnu's body are Nitya Matras? Is it good to understand like that? No, because they're Nitya Siddhas, they're Nitya Siddhas. They're with the Lord, they're with the Spirit, it's past times eternally. Yeah. In the spiritual world, not in the yeah, so, so the uh, Mahavishnu has uh, unlimited uh, jivas in, in him. So can we, I mean, is it good to understand that those jivas are Nitya Vatas? Yeah, more or less. Hare Krishna Mahaj. Uh, in Chaitanya Chandra, uh, Chaitanya Chandra stated that if someone wants to see the, sincerely wants to see the Lord, and at the same time, they want to enjoy this material world, it is considered to be a fool. So, okay. No, they are both ways of course. Yeah, how do they understand this? Well, um, that person may say, yes, I desire the Lord. But if actually he has the desire to keep enjoying the material world, it is not possible to surrender to the Lord simultaneously. It's like, um, the example is given of uh, if you're an object going this way and you want to get the object, you have to go that way. You have to follow the object that way. But you can't go this way. So if object is going this way, you go this way, you're a fool. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're tracing after material energy this way and say, I want Krishna. How you can get it? You can, you can say it in words, but actually if you're still attached to material energy and you really don't want to surrender to Krishna, you're not going to get it. So that's the foolishness. So that means we have to live each and everything like that. Uh, we have to live each and everything uh, like ultimately, and ultimately, ultimately, but not, not immediately. <laughs> but one has to have a willingness to give up things, enjoyment, for the pleasure of Krishna. But, as I said, this is a gradual process. So therefore, uh, we find that uh, Lord Chaitanya says, whether you are a householder or you are now, you practice. It doesn't matter. In any case, you can practice. 
So it's not an immediate demand that everybody give everything up. Because technically that cannot be done. It's very rare for us to can do that. So therefore, the process is a gradual process. But in case of Dhruva, in this context, only this Dhruva only will have to In this context, Dhruva will want only a uh, higher star position of the so which is material. He only went after, though he went to after the Lord, he went after his material this year. So he didn't go, I mean, it is when he went to the this is an opposite direction. Well, uh, he had, let's say he was practicing mixed bhakti. He worshipped the Lord uh, because of the, uh, his mother's instruction and then the instruction of Narada Muni. And then he had the desire to also attain a material kingdom. So he had mixed, it was mixed. It's not that he simply wanted to enjoy the material kingdom. He also had some uh, affection for the Lord. Well, uh, in that sense, we can say everything belongs to the Lord, so uh, we can enjoy it, <laughs> enjoy it materially or whatever, because it represents the Supreme Lord. But that's not our philosophy. Uh, I think uh, the what was it? Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who was sitting on, uh, as a child on top of a pile of garbage, says it's all one. It's all you know. So what's the difference between clean and unclean, etc., like this? So that's not our philosophy. Uh, that's the Maya philosophy, whatever. Uh, so we make distinctions in the material world from different things, and, and generally material objects are material, they're not spiritual things. They're quite different. We can use material objects, some material objects, which are approved in scriptures for serving the Lord, then they get transformed. But otherwise, uh, matter is matter, and uh, spirit is spirit. In the Gita, Lord Krishna mentions Ramana. Does this mean accepting bhakti is very difficult? Oh, Ramana For most people. Yeah, in, in general, it is rare because, as he says, you go through these different levels. So we have a karma yoga system for people in general who are fortunate enough to accept that system, and everybody outside that system is a very unfortunate. So there, in that sense, even that is a little rare, to participate in the Brahman system. And then to come to the top of the system, they got Brahman, that is more rare. And then to be a devotee of the Lord is rare. So in that sense, yes, it is rare. Association. 
with other people who do commit other arts. That's usually the usual case. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So actually, as per the marginal energy, there are two different categories. It is Siddhas and Nitya Bhaddas. Okay. So how can we understand that Nitya Bhaddas? Because if, if uh, Nitya Bhaddas, they meet a devotee, they can stand their bhakti and they can liberate from the Nitya Bhaddas state. So how can we understand this Nitya Bhaddas? Yeah, technically, uh, the, the Nitya there is not really proper. Okay. So it's there in Chaitanya Church, Pramarka. Um, Chiku Goswami doesn't use that term. <laughs> that there, Nitya Bhaddas. Just says that there's no beginning to that, but the state. So that does not imply future, also very eternally bound. So when you say Nitya Bada, uh, that means in the past, no beginning, but future can get out of that song. So uh, that's why he doesn't accept your Nitya Bada in his works. If it were, there would be no possible beginning of the material world, so therefore, you know, I have any process at all, or pure dharma or anything. <laughs> yeah, if someone in fully Krishna consciousness and uh, as well he has uh, some one or two material results, is that considered to be a sattva or a sarati Depends on the desire. <laughs> 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 but if he's practicing Krishna consciousness and he's not practicing with the desire to get that fulfilled, then it's been called pure one. We have the desires, obviously, everybody is like an artist or whatever is there. But if when we're worshiping the Lord or chanting, we're not praying for material things, then there's no problem. We can still call it pure bhakti. Sometimes, common people believe that nothing is happening. They may even think that, oh, all this happened in those days. Why do we call it the same thing? They're always compared. Yeah, well, they can, and they get into the same problems. <laughs> They didn't get very good results. They end up cursing each other and suffering in the material world as a result. Like the Ayati has to go around asking his son, give me your youth or whatever like this. And three of them refuse actually. They refuse their father. They're not going to give him anything. <laughs> and it can be the other way around also. So we can see how foolish they were and we can rectify ourselves. <laughs> Examples of what I have to say. Vishnu also can see people that have not get married. Yes. So that my father can be happy. So it gives nice examples of the problems in the material world. <laughs>